Hi, everybody. Welcome. It is Wednesday, the 2nd of June. Welcome to the Overeaters Anonymous 100 Pounder Special Focus Meeting. Today, I am absolutely delighted to welcome Karen Kay from Virginia. She's going to speak to us about her experience, strength and hope. She came to OA in 1993 and has been in and out of the rooms and uh, finally took her seat in 2017. So I'll let her explain how she did that. Thanks so much, Karen. Take it away. Thank you. Um... Karen Kay from Virginia, recovered compulsive overeater. Um, thank you for allowing me to do service and um, welcome to all the newcomers here today. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I'm a nervous wreck, so um, I'm probably gonna talk fast. Um, I kind of typed out my share because that's kind of how I have to do it, but um, I do wanna share some pictures. So I'm going to try and do this. So my disease um, takes all forms, um, restricting, purging, uh, overeating, overexercising. And so this was in, I, w I got smaller than this, um, but this was like the only pictures I could find of like the restricting um, time and that didn't last too long. And then I started putting on weight and that was, this was when I went to my first treatment center here. Um, and then I got well and physically well. And, um, and here I was and I met my husband and I joke and tell him I kind of lured him in during this time period of brief uh, physical recovery and a little bit of wellness. Um, and then I started having children. And as you can see, um, the weight just came on. Um, the restricting and purging was still happening, but not working. Um, the overeating took over. And as you can see, I just got bigger and bigger. Um, and then this was like the last pictures I had, of, and I actually got a little bit bigger than this. Um, this is walking around DC one time with my family, and we spent most of the day looking for a pharmacy that I could get that um, that glide, that body glide that runners use um, because my legs were chafing so bad and they were bleeding. Um, and here I am today. This was um, like last year. This was around um, April. This is just a couple Ready. of weeks ago. And this is a picture of my wedding rings because they just kind of come into the, come into play. So um, let's see. I'm going to stop sharing and go to, okay. Um, so um, again, like I'm super nervous. Um, so uh, I base my qualification share on the passage from the big book and I'm not still sharing, am I? Okay. Um, Page 25 in there is a solution. It says, if you are as seriously alcoholic as we were, we believe there's no middle of the road solution. We were in a position where life was becoming impossible. And if we had passed into the region from which there is no return through human aid, we had but two alternatives. One was to go on to the bitter end, blotting out the consciousness of our intolerable situation as best we could, and the other to accept spiritual help. This we did because we honestly wanted to and were willing to make the effort. So um, I wanna share with the newcomer how my life was impossible and intolerable in my food addiction. Um, I do believe that I was a um, okay, compulsive overeater from the time I was born. I don't ever remember a time where I wasn't concerned with food. Um, as a child and teenager, I spent all my time thinking about what to eat and what not to eat, how to get food, hide food, purge food. Um, I would have sleepovers at girls' houses just because I knew they had sugared cereals. Um, I looked forward to snacks and foods that my mom didn't give us. Um, I couldn't control myself around sugar um, and many times sacrificed myself to people or situations just so I could get the food. Uh, before my portion of food was given to me, I knew it wasn't enough. Um, my babysitting jobs revolved around babies, which I adore, and the food they had. Um, eat what you want was always told to me until it wasn't. I had a regular babysitting job in middle school, and I was searching their kitchen for food. And when I opened the freezer, there were signs on food that said, don't eat. And the message was for me. Um, I was humiliated. Um, in college, you know, some people gained the freshman 15, I gained the freshman 40 um, and quickly lost the weight. I dieted and quickly lost the weight. 
um, as a young adult at a college and moved 13 times between six states. Um, I was miserable and trying to outrun myself. Um, one year I had W4s from three different states. Um, allergic to food. I break out in spots, right? Colorado, the Hamptons, New York City. Um, I had this idea that things would be better if I lived somewhere else. Um, I needed to reinvent myself. I would get thinner or lose the weight if I lived a different lifestyle. Um, lifestyle sometimes included abusing alcohol and drugs, and I just didn't care as long as it would help me control and manage my food and my body. Um, I was fully aware that I was doing things with food that other people weren't. Um, I lived a very edgy wild life with the food, with the restricting and the purging and over-exercising, and that worked for a long time in my life until it didn't and the weight started creeping on. Um, I'm part of what I call a show family. My family's very concerned with outward appearances, so the thinner the better. Um, so with the starvation and the bulimia, no one said a word to me. But when that stopped working and my eating disorder started showing up on my body in a way that wasn't attractive, um, off to treatment I went. Um, treatment helped me with my weight. Um, my body recovered physically and I met my soon to be husband afterwards. Um, I was abstinent and practicing healthy boundaries and behaviors. Um, we got engaged and chose the engagement rings I just showed you. Um, these rings are eternity bands, the stones go all the way around and they were gorgeous. And knowing my history, I asked um, the sales lady if these could be sized. I live in the South and she was like, bless your heart, honey. You would have to gain a tremendous amount of weight for these rings not to fit you. And I wore those rings for six months of my marriage and I'll be married 19 years in the fall. Um, as a newlywed, I started grad school, and by the time I graduated, I can no longer fit in the seats that had the attached desk to them. I was gaining weight so quickly and determined that it was my husband and the marriage that was the problem. I was always blaming other people for my life. Um, all I dreamed about was having babies. I couldn't wait. Um, I didn't care about the wedding. I just wanted the babies. Um, I had two healthy babies, but I couldn't fully participate with them like I had dreamed about, and it was crushing to me. Um, I would go to treatment often. Um, I left my husband with my 15-year-old baby for a month. After I had my second child, I would leave my husband and children and tell them I was going to mommy camp. Um, and my children would wave goodbye, and I would come home weeks later with crafts that I had bought at Michael's while I was away and tell them everything I learned at mommy camp. I was doing anything to get better. Um, life as a mother was difficult and I felt like I wasn't up for the job. It was all too much. Like I just, it was like this thing, everything's too much, it's all too much. And the only way I could deal with the all too much of life was to use all too much food. Um, as my children got older, my husband told me not to come downstairs in the morning before school because I was a bull in a china shop and made the children cry. Um, I expected perfection out of them. And meanwhile, I'd been sleeping off a food vendor and woke up remorseful and angry with myself every morning. Um, here I was trying to be good. And first thing in the morning, they were giving me aggravation. Um, these feelings were so impossible to handle without food. So I ate. Um, I was in a horrible addiction cycle for, with food for years and years. Um, I vowed to stop every day and I never could. Um, I lost all ability to make decisions. I was like a third child for my husband. I would call him at work to ask him if he thought I had enough time to go to the grocery store or should I wash this kid's uniform? Like, like silly stuff. I couldn't make a decision. Um, I was so scared. I was like scared of what was going to happen in life, what people thought of me and my family and super scared that my children were going to have to live with the fact that their mother chose food over them and died of food addiction. Um, I was a huge people pleaser. I wanted everyone to be happy with me, happy with my family. Um, the bar was raised so high for all the members of my family, but me. Um, I, our family motto was we can do hard things and I would encourage them and, and, and tell them every day, off you go, we can do hard things. But meanwhile, I'd go back to bed and I'd sleep and I'd eat and get bigger and bigger. Um, the lying, the lying was like, clockwork. It was easier to lie than tell the truth in all areas of my life. Um, 
lying to my husband to go out so I could get food, lying to my kids when they asked me what I did all day when they were at school. It was just, it, it just came on just natural. Um, my house is a mess. My husband would come home from work and dishes everywhere, laundry everywhere, um, toys. And I would walk around like, where's the mother in this family? And like, it was me, like I'm the mother, but I couldn't do it. I just couldn't show up. My husband always picked up the slack for me, like his sick, addicted wife, and he just picked it up. Um, physically, a mess. Um, I would come down in the mornings and I wouldn't come up, go back up until bedtime. Um, it was so painful to walk. I had sleep apnea, I used a CPAP, I had blood pressure medication. Um, I was eating right up until bedtime most nights and waking up choking on my own vomit. Um, I had to sleep sitting up. I had significant family history of breast cancer, so I have to go for an MRI every year. And um, the last year, like at the end, like at one of the visits, there was this big powwow because they weren't sure if I was going to fit in the MRI machine. Um, it was humiliating and demoralizing. Um, I just always had this feeling of wanting to jump out of my skin. Like I didn't feel well. I was irritable, anxious. Um, and if this is what life was like, like I just wasn't interested. Um, I would attend my children's field trips and I would drive behind them on the, I would drive behind the bus. I didn't ride with my children on the bus like other moms did. I told them I got car sick, so I needed to drive myself. Um, I was always hot and sweaty. I didn't wear a winter coat for so many years. I was constantly out of breath. Um, my body was disabled by the weight. Um, I've always worked like a, when I was like not morbidly obese, I worked like a variety of super cool, interesting jobs. And I always had like a certain style or a certain look. Um, at the end of this run with my addiction, like that was gone. Like I bought clothes on whether they fit or not. And they were all black. Um, I didn't even try to look nice. Um, and here I was, I had everything I ever wanted, a loving, supportive and kind husband, uh, two like healthy, flourishing children. I had my master's. I had I had a house in the, in the suburbs, a summer beach vacation, stay at home, mom, financially secure. Like even having all of this, my life was insane and impossible and not worth living. Um, I wanted to die and I told my husband that almost daily. My disease just didn't care, didn't care what I had. Um, and I continued to blot it out with food over and over again for years and years, restricting, purging, overeating. Um, at the end of stages of my addiction, I was so irritable, restless, and discontent until I got another hit from the food. Um, I was just so owned by this disease, and it was so clear. I was powerless over food, and my life had become unmanageable. Um, the passage talks about middle-of-the-road solutions, and here are some of mine. Um, like thousands of dollars in treatment centers. I went to treatment like people went on special vacations. Doctors, therapists, nutritionists, a couple of visits to the psych ward. Supplements, essential oils, acupuncture, diets. Um, I actually paid $2,000 for a Heal Your Mind with Food program online and never logged in for a username or password. Um, Self-help books, keto, paleo, fasting, starving, purging, over-exercising, and kick-ass sponsors, right? Um, in More About Alcoholism on page 30, it says the idea that somehow, someday he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. And the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. And I had the illusion for years and years that I was gonna be able to get this. Um, things would be different. I'd gain the power to control the disease and continue to receive the effect the food had on me. The numbing out, the not feeling, the hiding, um, all an illusion. Um, it was just all too much, the thoughts and the feelings. Um, I couldn't get any relief, so I continued to try to get relief with more food. So I'm a real alcoholic, right? I'm a real food addict. So I had two choices. I could continue to eat and live in intolerable, impossible situation, or I could accept, accept spiritual help. So what happened? So I was introduced to OA in my early 20s, over 28 years ago. Um, I started attending meetings and definitely didn't feel like I was sitting at the cool kids table, right? I was the youngest by far and physically I didn't look like anybody there. Little did I know 
the progressive nature of my disease and that years later, I would be much, much bigger than all those women that I sat there judging. Um, I'd hop in and out of the rooms, particularly after horrible food vendors. Um, I'd sob. Um, I wanted what they had, but I couldn't get serious. I always had another chick up my sleeve, right? All those things that I just talked about, all those middle of the road solutions. Tried them all in between, in and out of the rooms. Um, I did not want OA to be my solution and I couldn't get out of my own way. I'd take numbers and call fellows when I was scared or had a horrible time. And then I would go back out and do my own thing. Um, I was afraid of being a member. Like I wasn't sold on it. I didn't want what OA had. Um, I'd get a sponsor, I'd get abstinent, I'd work a half-assed program. Um, I told myself, like, you guys might need the 12 steps, but I don't. Um, you all may need to speak of this higher power, but, but I just, I don't. Um, I just need to get abstinent and the weight will take care of itself and I'll continue on my merry way and that's all I need. And because I have the disease of compulsive overeating, the day always came when I couldn't continue to be abstinent. Um, I, was work, I wasn't working a program. I was hoping to get well just by being around like checklists, right? I was relying on like sponsors, abstinence, weighing and measuring, going to meetings. Yep, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. Um, but I wasn't working a program, I was, I was on a diet. And I was relying on self-will not to pick up the food or the food behaviors. And because I have the disease of compulsive overeating, my self-will has an expiration date. It may be an hour, a day, a month, even a few months, but it always is up. Um, if I did try the spiritual path, I was just praying for the obsession to be lifted and for my behavior to be arrested. Um, I was sure I'd be able to eat food like other people one day. I was just sure of it. Um, I still thought I just had a food problem. Um, so obviously this didn't work. Um, I kept trying and, and failing with the food and the focus was always the food. I would just break my diet. Um, I don't like to say that I relapsed because I really wasn't recovered from anything to relapse from. Um, and then the day came and my disease progressed and I was so much closer to death than life. Um, I didn't want to live anymore. Like I explained before, like my body was failing me, like my life was nothing I wanted. And to be really honest, the real reason I came back was for my children. Um, time was flying by, they were growing up and I wasn't present and I was missing their life. They were 10 and 12. And if I didn't get my shit together, like another 10 or 12 was gonna go by and I would still be in, in this state of, of, of addiction. And I was filled with guilt and shame like big time. So I kept running away from OA for 25 years um, until the day came when I pulled up a chair and settled in. I was over 330 pounds and dying. Um, I had tried everything I knew and I was defeated. Uh, I realized I didn't have a food problem, I had a life problem. Um, I had been anorexic thin, thin and morbidly obese and I felt just as bad at both weights and everything in between. Food and weight was not my issue. Um, so I finally came to a place where I honestly wanted spiritual help and I was willing to go to any lengths and, and man, I was ready. Um, I was terrified of dying from this disease and I was terrified of living with this disease. Um, so the first thing I had to do was put down all my alcoholic foods and food behaviors. And people ask me like, how, like, right? Like how, how do you put it down, right? How do we do this? Like, I wish I had a magical answer for that. But like, for me, I was just so done. I was done. Like the eating disorder was ruling me and the brain craziness. Like I was fully convinced that there was no alternative for me. Um, my disease had done the job of convincing me that I had absolutely no power or control where food was concerned. And I had no more lurking notions. I had nothing, no more tricks, like nothing, nothing. Um, I asked the sponsor for help. Um, and I worked the steps with the sponsor and did everything she told me. Um, finished the 12 steps and was out there sponsoring and living in 10, 11, 12. And the thing is, is that like, I would still go on these meetings and hear people saying that they were living a life beyond their wildest dreams. And that is not what I was experiencing. Um, my brain was still battling food thoughts. The promises weren't coming true for me. Um, had things improved? Yes. Um, did this whole OA life and everything I was doing to ensure abstinence was it worth it? I'm like, no, not really. Um, I had friends who had the exact same sponsor as me, <clears throat> got recovered. So what was wrong with me? Like, I, I must be one of the unfortunates that they talk about. 
Um, my spiritual path had nothing to do with my sponsor and everything to do with me. Um, I was ready to give up, but my higher power hadn't given up on me. Uh, my higher power kept me in the rooms and led me to another fellow. And I reached out to her and explained that I was abstinent and I'd worked the steps and I didn't have what y'all have. Um, I was very clear that my way wasn't working and I wanted to try again. Um, abstinence without spirituality is so painful, like more painful than just being in the food. Um, and she said she could help me and she gave me exact instructions. Um, I reevaluated my abstinence and put more food down. I took directions. I didn't negotiate, like I was done, done, done. Um, I followed the instructions in the book and worked the steps like following a prescription for any other fatal illness. And I started working a spiritual program and not a food program. Um, abstinence does not equal wellness for me. Um, it is a requirement in order for me to work the steps and get well and get spiritual wellness. So it felt really weird and uncomfortable with all my judgment and everything I thought about people who believed in higher powers and God. Um, but it meant like every waking moment I was learning how to do life differently and it did not come easily. Um, so much judgment and prejudice um, towards people that said the word God, um, taught, you know, believed in God. Um, I was afraid of those people. I was afraid that I was gonna be a holy roller. I was afraid that I was gonna have cross-stitched prayers on my walls. I was afraid I would never be able to swear again. Um, ton of fear. And so I had a lot of work to do regarding my higher power. Um, and I had to find a higher power that worked for me as an adult and not as a child. Um, my childhood higher power I was pretty terrified of um, and worried about all the bad choices I had made in my addiction and how that was gonna influence me and my family. So today, like my higher power has qualities like a friend I'd like to sit and have coffee with. Humor, it's gotta, I mean, my higher power has to have humor, be forgiving, loving. Um, and most importantly, I had to trust this higher power. So I got to work on this relationship. I would put reminders on my phone. I put notes out. Um, I reached out to fellows to learn what their spirituality looked like. I was desperate and dying. And I knew the only solution for me was a spiritual one. Um, I recognized a power and believe that a power greater than myself was the only solution. Um, I believe this power could restore me to a functioning person again, not restore me to a healthy body, not make life easier, not make the people around me behave the way I want, but restore me to sanity. Um, and I worked super hard. Um, and I made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God as I understand him. It was in my best interest to turn my life over. Left to my own devices, I was killing myself. Um, I had a life problem. Um, I couldn't function without abusing myself with food. So I had to trust and learn and take action. Um, I didn't know how to feed myself. I certainly didn't know what was right for me in the rest of my life. And I felt like a baby um, learning how to do life again. My sponsor guided me to my higher power at every juncture. And I didn't like that in the beginning. Um, I didn't like that she said, go to your higher power because I wanted her to make these big decisions for me. And I certainly didn't want to make them. Um, and so she'd guide me and, and she would help me learn how to start relying on my higher power. And she still does that for me today. And, and, and I get like, I get it. I get quiet and I ask God. Um, the rest of the steps I've worked thoroughly and honestly, like no more lies, like, like no more lies. Um, I've gotten so much clarity on my, the nature of my selfish disease. Um, my sponsor helped me see my part in my life and, and she, she'll say to me like, that is so selfish or this is self-centered behavior. And I need straight shooters like that in my life. Um, uh, I discovered, you know, how I'd been living like full of self. Um, I want, you know, I want life to be comfortable. I want it to be easy. And the antics I went through trying to ensure that was absolutely insane. Um, step six and seven, when I talk about my character defects, um, I learned that I couldn't just like lay on my bed and ask God to remove them and then just carry on. Like I had to show up. I had to be part of the solution. Um, my amends, like to my husband and my children, just like, like life changing for me. I caused the greatest amount of destruction with my own little family. Um, and my amends couldn't just be words. They couldn't just be words. They required me to show up differently. Um, I couldn't continue to behave in the way that I behaved. 
Um, I like to always talk about like, I had a lot, I had slept, I had sleep apnea and stuff. I couldn't Girl Scout camp with my daughter due to my weight. Um, I wasn't fully recovered yet, but we had watched a movie one night um, and as a family and at the end of the movie, I woke up and said, oh, I missed the whole thing. I fell asleep. She started jumping up and down and like smiling. And she's like, oh my gosh. And I was like, what? I fell asleep. Well, I wasn't snoring and I didn't have apnea. And she said, mommy can go camping now. And three months later, we were camping. We were out there camping. And this is what like my life looks like. Karen, you have five minutes left. Okay, great. thank you. Um, and so my life, it's centered around God. Like my ideas and decisions is, is God. Like everything has to go through God. Um, I can't strong arm people into behaving the way I, I deem correct. Um, you know, my, my impulsive texting, impulsive words, like pa I, I'm learning to pause. Like things are not perfect. Like I am a progress. Um, but all day I asked myself how God would have me be. Um, I, I know for sure that God didn't wake me up today to yell at my kids and run over my husband with my words. Um, my children, I talk about addiction with them. I hid this from them for so long. They know I'm a sponsor. They know I have a sponsor. They know I have phone calls. They know I'm speaking on this meeting today. Um, you know, like I was always so worried to use the words Overeaters Anonymous. And like we were driving in the car um, a couple months ago and my son said, mom, you know, you're losing weight and how, you know, how are you doing this? And he's like, you know, this was probably about a year ago. And I said, oh, the program and OA. And he's like, mommy, I'm so proud of you. Oh, mommy, this is so good. And we owe it all. And he was like getting like super excited. And he's like, we owe it all to Overeaters Anonymous. And I was like, Arr! like I, like, I couldn't say that word for 20 something years. And here's my, my 13 year old, like proud and like, like, like joyously saying the words Overeaters Anonymous. Like, this is me. This is my life today. I'm not hiding. Um, I don't know what God has planned for my kids. Don't know what God has planned for me, but I am sure that they're going to come across an addict of probably 10 in their life. And maybe, or just maybe, my journey will benefit them. Um, the mother that couldn't bring her kids, that couldn't go downstairs before school, I was riding bikes with my daughter to school before COVID. Um, I, I'm, I'm part of life. Like, life isn't easy, but I'm part of it. Like, the little things in life are not wasted on me today, right? Tomorrow, I'm doing a 10K walk. I couldn't walk my dog. Um, I can cross my legs. I can buy clothes. I can, I, I, I can have a winter jacket that I zip up and stay warm. Like these little things in life, they're not wasted on me anymore. Um, I don't take stuff for granted. Um, my children, my husband mean everything to me, but without my higher power and OA, I'm nothing. I'm just nothing. Um, although I've had a very significant physical transformation, I've lost over 130 pounds. I do believe that my inside transformation is even greater than what you can see with the human eye. Never thought I would say that. Um, I don't know what God has planned for me, but every day I trust his plan um, the best I can. And so far he hasn't led me astray. Um, one last thing. So those wedding rings, um, I started being able to wear them about eight weeks ago and I don't ever wanna take them off with the help of my higher power. Um, and thank you for letting me share. And I'm going to read um, The Tenth Step Promises, um, chapter six, page 84, bottom of the page, big book edition, fourth edition. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol. For by this time, sanity will have returned. We will seldom be interested in liquor. If tempted, we, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. We react sanely and normally, and we will find that this has happened automatically. We will see that our new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on our part. It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, neither, neither are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we have been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. We are neither cocky nor are we afraid. That is our experience. That is how we react as long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. 
in my life today, that stuff's coming true. And I do believe that um, I've experienced a miracle. So thank you for allowing me to do service. Karen Kay, thank you so much. That was just wonderful.